Hey, if you've got a Bible there, open to, uh, open to 1 Kings uh, chapter 19 for me this morning. And um, just want to continue on a little bit with uh, what we were talking about last week. Who, who's been tuning in online? Who, who was able to tune in online, yeah? Okay, that's, that's great because there was a lot more than you guys um, uh, tuning in online. So I'm trying to work out where all, who the, all the other people were that were we're watching us as well, but um, it's great technology. What a good time to go through some of the stuff we're going through. I know some people hate technology. Uh, it was very awkward. Me and Daniel were coming in on Friday, you film, and you're kind of standing here, just sort of deadpan with no reaction, no life, um, wondering whether this is scratching where anybody's itching or if it's making sense. Um, I haven't got people to look at as they go, what the hell? Like this, and I go, oh, that didn't make sense, or uh, have somebody laugh at my joke, so I actually know it was funny. Instead, I'm telling it into cyberspace and afterwards going, geez, I hope that one was funny. I wonder if people are laughing at home. So all those awkward things that happen when you're in a room kind of by yourself. So it is good to, to be back together. Who likes success stories? Hands up if you love a good success story. Yep, most people like success. Who loves failure stories? Yeah, some, some people, yep, yep, I'm a bit like you. I, yeah, I, I quite enjoy them for different reasons, not because of the failure per se. Uh, because of the lessons you can learn. But uh, we love success stories. And as a result of that, isn't it interesting? Anyone ever, um, I, I read lots of, because I have an evangelistic bent, of course, I read a lot of books written by evangelists and listen to a lot of evangelists speak and so on. And you could easily be forgiven for thinking every single time they get on a plane. Every time they get on a plane, they lead that person in the seat next to them to Jesus. Anyone ever get that impression? Every time they get on a plane, they have a spiritual conversation with the person next. And it doesn't matter what's going on. They just manage to turn this innocuous, nothing situation into an, a moment where they're repenting in their chair and crying and the hostesses are bringing tissues. And, and it's must, it sounds like it happens every time they get on a plane. Because that's what they talk about all the time. Or, or what about the people that every time they pray for the sick, the sick get healed? Anyone ever hear people? And sometimes you think, man, if you're that good, would you come and pray for me right now? Can I take you to a... Because it just seems like every single person you lay hands on gets instantly healed and jumps up. Like, who doesn't want that? So we feel like that sometimes because uh, teachers and preachers and so on, every, every, <coughs> as, as a pastor... I, I hear sometimes uh, preachers, they get up and they talk about the message they preached on Sunday. And they talk about this amazing response where the Holy Spirit just fell. And everybody started weeping all over the building. And that pocket up the back were manifesting their demons. And uh, all, all manner of stuff was going on. And people were crawling up the front. They grabbed me, shaking me, saying, what must I do to be saved? And I think... Well, come and preach in my church. Some Sundays I'm just not sure whether I'm making sense. Uh, you know, sometimes there's crickets chirping and I don't know. You've got to just trust the Holy Spirit sometimes. Sometimes there's a lot of energy. Sometimes there's not. But every time you preach, your church goes into a mini revival. But the truth is, the reason we hear about everybody's success stories all the time is because, well, nobody really wants to have you stand up and just talk about your failures all the time. How many of you, if you tuned into your favorite preacher and every week all he talked about was, was, oh, we had a service in our church last week and it was an absolute flop. Absolute flop. I preached a message and it was garbage. Nobody liked it. As a matter of fact, I got criticized afterwards. People got up halfway through and started walking out. I reckon after three or four times on that YouTube channel, you probably wouldn't want to go back there again, would you? Or what about the, the evangelist that writes his book? And he says, you know, I got on a plane the other day and I got on this plane, I sat down and this person sat down next to me and they were wiping their eyes. I could tell they'd been crying. So I picked up a book, read it, watched the movie and went to sleep. Got up, got off the plane and got on with my day. And chapter one and chapter two and chapter five and chapter 10, it's the same stories. Nothing ever happened. You probably wouldn't be that interested in picking up that guy's book or reading that guy's book or the person that just spent their whole time telling you how yeah I remember I went and prayed for this this lady and I felt the presence of God and my hand got hot and I started shaking and she just looked up at me and didn't move nothing happened I said just believe by faith anyway a week later I got an email and guess what nothing had changed still a week later you probably wouldn't be so inspired by that and you probably wouldn't really want to listen to that sort of stuff all the time. So when, when people preach and write and teach, the truth is they share their success stories in the hope that that builds faith. Amen. I want to be in a place 
where faith is getting built. And so I tend to gravitate and listen to those kinds of the success stories because it builds faith. I remember having this discussion with God once in India. We were, uh, there was a big crusade in our town. This Canadian evangelist came over and I was part of a group that had organized and we were meeting in the biggest paddock in Nagpur in central India. Tens of thousands of people, just people everywhere. And every night he'd get up and he would preach. And he would, I didn't necessarily agree with his, the way he did things, but that's just opinion. But he would get up and he would say, if you're sick, come forward, Jesus will heal you. And so I watched these Indian villagers that had walked for miles walk up and get prayed for and then um, walk away the same state that they were. And then the next night, the same people had come, and he kept on, and I got angry. By the end of seven days, seven nights of crusades, I was driving through Nagpur on my way home on my motorbike and just having a rant at God saying, God, this is ridiculous. This is a joke. Everyone's not getting healed, and he keeps making these promises. And the Holy Spirit just gently said to me, said, Alan, okay, so what's the truth? I said, well, the truth is that some people are going to get healed, but some aren't. And he said, that's right. He said, what about getting saved? I said, well, some people are going to uh, get there, you know, radically, tra- some aren't. He said, that's right. He said, so what if he gets up tonight, tomorrow night, and says, hey, I want to pray for you. The power of God is here. Some of you will get healed and some of you won't. He said, what category do you think most people will put themselves in? And I thought, well, if it was me, I'd probably put myself in the I'm not going to get healed category. And they said, and if that's the case, then how much faith do you think I've got to work with in an environment like that? And so I had to repent for the rest of the bike ride. I'm sorry, God, you know more than I do. And uh, so there's something about creating environments of faith, and that comes through sharing all our successes and so on. What I want to do today, though, is I want to point you to what I believe was a moment in a man of God's life that wasn't so successful. A moment in time where I think in hindsight, isn't hindsight a beautiful thing? You ever done something and thought, geez, I'm smart, I'm so clever, this is amazing, I'm so insightful. And then in hindsight, you look back and you go, oh, I cannot believe I'd handled it that way. Anyone ever... No, I'm the only person in the whole room who's ever done something and looked back and gone, that was really dumb. Geez, don't I feel alienated from the rest of you perfect folk right now. <laughs> I want to share with you a moment in the life of a man of God, and you might have heard of him, his name was Elijah. And this is a moment where I believe Elijah did some things that weren't healthy in an environment and a situation that he found himself in. Last week, we, we started talking about anxiety and worry, and I want to sort of continue down that theme of anxiety and worry this week. I don't want to put all of the precursors in. I would said that last week. I'm not a doctor. I'm not medically trained. My training is more theology and people, not medical. So I'm not offering medical advice. I'm not speaking to people that have medically diagnosed anxiety disorders. That's a category that's out of my league. What I'm talking to is that general undercurrent that many people experience of worry and anxiety in their life. And it's something that has been exacerbated through the season that we're going through right now. Would everybody agree with that? Through what we've gone through in the last 18 months, there's this undercurrent of anxiety and worry. And so I'm speaking to people who are experiencing that undercurrent of, desire, of anxiety and worry. I'm not a natural, naturally anxious and worrying type of person. But even I've found in the last 18 months that there are areas in my world where I've, I've caught myself with a little bit of anxiety or worry. And that anxiety and worry, as I've mentioned last week, and if you haven't seen it, go on, on YouTube, it'll make more sense. Anxiety and worry are not a sin, they're a symptom. They're a symptom that there's something you're facing, dealing with, going through, that you can't handle in your own natural capacity, resource, or whatever. You need some help outside of yourself. And so just as a runny nose, you reach for a tissue, a sore throat, and you get the Benadryl. When worry and anxiety comes, we should reach for prayer. It's a symptom that we need God. It's a symptom that should point us to God's divine medicine cabinet of prayer. So go back, watch last week's if you haven't, and that'll explain that. This week, I want to take it a little bit further, and I want to talk about the the life of Elijah and just give you three things, just three simple little things that I believe Elijah did in the midst of a very worrying and anxious time in his life, three things that were incredibly unhealthy. And maybe as I'm sharing this, you might think about your own world and realize, you know, I, I, I have a tendency to go that way, or I've made that mistake, or I've done that. And maybe you're sitting here today and you're not anxious or worried about nothing, but you know other people that are struggling with this. Well, maybe you can get some stuff out of today that can help you to point them in the right direction and help them a little bit to get through uh, their period of anxiety and worry, whatever it is that they're going through. Um, 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1 to 4. It says, And Ahab, King Ahab was a bad king, all right? He was not a good fella. He was a very bad guy. He married a woman. Anyone ever heard of a woman called Jezebel? Yep, she's famous now. She's got a spirit named after her. Um, Jezebel 
and uh, he marries Jezebel. She was not a follower of, of the God of the Jews. In fact, she was following all these other gods. And uh, King Ahab, he uh, uh, marries her and uh, basically goes after all of her gods and foreign religions. And uh, you know, Jezebel ends up killing all the, 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 the pre- prophets of God. She thought she'd killed them all, but there was a hundred of them that were secretly saved. But she's gone out and she's tried to wipe uh, uh, God, as we would say, Christianity off the map. She doesn't want Yahweh and she set up all these altars and priests to all these foreign gods. It says, and Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. Let me just backtrack a little bit. What is it that Ahab told his wife Jezebel that Elijah had done? Well, if you go back, Elijah gets a word from God, and the word is this, that the nation's going to go into uh, a famine. There's going to be a drought, no rain. For, and it, I think it went for around three years. And so, of course, Elijah, being the man of God, has the uncomfortable job of going to the king, Ahab, and saying, just got a message for you, Ahab. Uh, guess what? You're not going to get any rain for three years. Of course, that didn't make him the most popular kid on the block. So Ahab doesn't like Elijah. So Elijah takes off and God takes care of Elijah, feeds him with ravens and so on. There's a a bit of stuff in there about Elijah. And then what happens is God comes to Elijah and says, I'm going to end the drought. The drought's over. Go back and confront Ahab and and let him know. So he comes back. He gets toe-to-toe with Ahab. (coughs) And Ahab uh, uh, is still not very happy with him, calls him, you big, you disturber of the people. And, you know, you brought this upon us. And he says, no, 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 I didn't. This drought's here because you're an ungodly king. You've done the wrong thing. But anyway, here's what, here's what I'm going to get you to do. I want you to grab all of Israel. I want you to grab all the prophets of your foreign gods, uh, your priests of your foreign gods. You bring them to Mount Carmel. And we're going to have a bit of a showdown. That you and their gods and me and mine. And I want you to get all of Israel as well. I want you to bring all of Israel. So you can imagine this moment on Mount Carmel where the nation of Israel are gathered. You've got Elijah here. You've got the prophets of Baal and, and the priests of Baal all on that side. And Elijah says, here's what we're going to do. Build two altars. And they build two altars and they get the wood and everything and they get some animals and they sacrifice them, cut them up, put one on this altar, one on that altar. And then Elijah stands back and he says, here's what we're going to do. We're going to call upon both gods. You call upon yours, I'll call upon mine. And the God who answers by fire, let him be God. And Israel, make your mind up. Who are you going to follow? How long are you going to continue to go this way, that way? Make your mind up. And we're going to show you today definitively who is the one true God and then you're going to make your mind up. And so then he says to the prophets uh, of Baal, he says, you guys go for it. So they start dancing and carrying on and chanting and cutting themselves and all these religious things that they did to try to invoke their gods. And this went on for a long period of time. And Elijah's even mocking them, you know, is, is your God asleep? Is he relieving himself? Come on, keep going. Come on, surely he'll wake up eventually. And he's goading and mocking these prophets. And they go on until they're exhausted and nothing happens. And then, of course, the camera pans and it turns to Elijah. And Elijah goes, well, here's what we're going to do. Let's get some water and we'll soak the sacrifice and we'll soak the wood and we'll put a pile of water around it so that it's even more dramatic than it was going to be anyway. I often wonder, Elijah, why did you have to do that? It was going to be dramatic anyway. But maybe it was a sp- early days of special effects or something. But um, So he does that and then he calls upon his God and fire comes down and totally consumes the altar, the sacrifice, the whole thing. I mean, can you imagine, can you imagine being there in that moment watching a fire drop from heaven and just, boof, this sacrifice burns. And then Elijah turns and he looks at Israel and Israel goes, this is God. And Elijah goes, duh. He didn't do that. That was just my special effects. But um, Elijah goes, that's right. So then he says, grab all the prophets of Baal, bring them down to the river and we're going to kill them and we'll destroy everything that's, that's built and created this foreign God. We're going to get rid of it. We're going to reestablish Yahweh as the God of Israel and we're going to follow back after God because every time we follow God, guess what? We get blessed. Every time we turn our back on him, guess what? We're not blessed. There's something going on here, people. Make your mind up. Who are you going to follow? The God that blesses, that gives you peace, that loves you or are you going to keep chasing after all these other things? And so the prophets and the priests get brought down and he has them all killed. And Ahab is witnessing all of this. And so that's what Ahab goes back and he says, oh, Jezebel, let me tell you what I just saw. Here's what happened. And he unpacks the story. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me and do more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them one of the prophets that he'd killed, if I don't make your life like one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he, being Elijah, when Elijah saw that, he arose and ran for his life, and he went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. And he left his servant there, 
But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree and he prayed that he might die and said, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life for I am no better than my father's. So much gold in that passage of Elijah's life that we could talk about. But what I want to talk about today is very simply three simple little things that I believe Elijah did that were unhealthy, that didn't help him in that moment of worry and anxiety that took him from a place. Mount Carmel literally means the place where this victory took place, where the prophets were destroyed. It's called Mount Carmel. That literally means the the vineyard of God or the orchard of God or the garden of God. He starts out in a place of monumental victory. He starts out in the place where he's meant to be. God's called him to this place. God's called him to be there. One of the greatest power encounters you will read about in the entire, all of this collection of ancient documents is right there in 1 Kings 19. One of the biggest power encounters you'll come up against, God and the enemy, and God, the enemy does all he can, makes all this huff and puff, and God just goes, that's enough, bang, it's all over. How awesome is God that this is the God that we follow? One of the biggest power encounters you'll come across, he goes from standing in Mount Carmel, from the orchard of God, the vineyard of God, the place he's meant to be, and four verses later, he's laying, beaten, defeated, bewildered in the wilderness, saying, God, take my life, I can't deal with this. How do you go from Mount Carmel, the vineyard of God, the orchard of God, how do you go from that place of victory to within four verses, you're laying down going, God, take my life, I can't deal with this can't deal with this. Well, I believe there are three really simple, there'll be nothing profound, three very simple things that I believe that Elijah did that were not healthy. And when we face anxiety and worry, if we do what Elijah did, we can also find ourselves laying down in a wilderness. We'll find ourselves in that place where we're feeling defeated and overwhelmed and underdone. How do you go from that place to that place? And everybody knows the imagery of the wilderness in the Bible it's not a place that we're wanting to live in, is it? The wilderness is generally, a, it's a place of testing, of trial. It's also a place of isolation. It's also a place at times where the imagery is that God is not there. That's not true. But it's certainly not a place that we're encouraged to go to. I'd rather live in the vineyard of God, the orchard of God, than be laying face down, ready to give up in the wilderness. And here's three things that I think that Elijah did that probably weren't the most healthy. Number one, he entertained the wrong voices. We talked a bit about this last week. He entertained the wrong voices. It says, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also how he had executed the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah. Elijah must have been feeling pretty good. Who reckons he would? If you were there, let's imagine you're Elijah for a second. You've just called all the prophets together. They've danced around, done their stuff. You've been the mouthpiece of God, the voice of God. You've destroyed all these foreign gods, destroyed the prophets, destroyed the enemy, taught, getting ready to, to, to lead an entire nation in revival back. I mean, I'd feel pretty good. I'd feel like this is a pretty good moment in my life right here. I'd want to take a selfie with the whole nation of Israel in the background so I don't forget the day God used me to bring the greatest revival in human history. That's what I would want. And then it all changed. Why? Because he heard something. He heard something. And he entertained a voice that he probably shouldn't have given so much authority to in his life. God had just shown how much he was for him. God had just shown that this was the right time. God had shown that you're the right person in the right place. God had shown his his power, his authority. God had shown his ability to protect. I mean, how vulnerable would have Elijah felt standing there on Mount Carmel? with the nation of Israel around him who were not following the God he was talking about, with the king there who was not following the God he was talking about, and all the prophets of Baal and priests who were not following the God he was... He was the odd man out. He was the most vulnerable human being in that situation, yet God sustained him and kept him alive through that moment. I would have felt pretty good about myself right about there. Yet all it took was one voice, and that was about to change, and he was going to go running for his life. He lost his peace over something that somebody said. Proverbs 18, verse 21, we all know this. It says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Who's ever read that verse? Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Now, most of the time when we read that, or even when we hear it preached, what we, what we get out of that is, I've got to be careful with my words, make sure my words are bringing life and not death to you. I've got to make sure what I'm speaking is bringing life to the hearers. But the flip side is just as true. I've also got to be very careful what words I'm allowing myself to hear and take in. Because if life and death's in the power of the tongue, I can kill you with my words, but I can also give you life. 
But guess what? Words I allow myself to take in, they can give me life, but they can also kill me. So it's not just about the power of the tongue as in all that it is about is about what you say. It's also an admonition about what you allow yourself to entertain, what voices you allow yourself to give power to, authority to, dwell upon, meditate upon, and listen to. Proverbs uh, chapter 12 and verse 25 says this. It says, Anxiety in the heart of man causes depression, but a good word makes it glad. Now, Anxiety in the heart of man causes depression. Some translations use the word, uh, it says anxiety in the heart causes a man to bow down, causes it to bow down. What's interesting here is in the Hebrew, that word depression in the Hebrew, you know what it literally means? Most of the time, over half the time in the New Testament, you know what it's translated as in the Old Testament? Worship. It's literally the word worship. Anxiety, it, it, it says anxiety in the heart can cause a man to bow down and prostrate himself. That's literally what the word means. Anxiety in the heart causes a man to bow down and prostrate himself. Let me retranslate it by putting in that interpretation. When you worship or bow down to the wrong word, it produces anxiety in your heart. What's the antidote? Well, it says, but a good word makes it glad. So in other words, if you entertain the wrong voices, what you're basically doing is you're bowing down and prostrating yourself under those voices. That's what you're doing. You're, you're entertaining the wrong words, the wrong thoughts, the wrong stuff. You're bowing and prostrating yourself as an act of worship under the authority of those words. You're giving those words a type of authority that they don't deserve in your life. What's the antidote? The antidote is replace those words. If that kind of word causes you to bow down, and cause anxiety, well, a good word produces a glad heart. So what sort of voices are you entertaining at this season of your life? What voices are you entertaining when it comes to who you are? What voices do you entertain when it comes to who God is? What voices are you entertaining when it comes to the climate of the world and what's happening right now? What voices, what words are you giving the greatest authority to? You see, the beginning of this downward spiral for Elijah was that he entertained the wrong voices. He entertained the wrong voices. And we can be guilty of doing the same thing. This whole saga began because he actually entertained the wrong thoughts. And I wonder how many of us in our world are entertaining the wrong thoughts. You know, I've got, I've got thoughts about who I am. And a lot of those thoughts, I trace the root of the voices, they go back to my childhood. They go back to, to moments of failure. They go back to moments where I didn't cut the mustard. They go back to things that were spoken to me by people who didn't see the potential and the reality of my life. They go back to things that are anti-God. We were all told certain things maybe as we grew up or, and those voices, don't they? They, they, they? Sometimes they just keep on playing in our world. And, and what I want to do is replace those with the word of God because God tells me who I am as well. And I like God's version of me. I like God's picture of me. I reckon it's pretty good. The world tells me who God is, but I like what the word of God tells me who God is. I like the word of God's picture of who God is. But if we entertain the wrong voices, I want you to get that imagery. It's like you bow down and you're worshipping those things. They have the capacity to bring you down, to prostrate yourself. I don't want to give that level of authority to the wrong voices in my life. So be careful what voices you entertain. This whole, this whole passage of Elijah's life began with something as simple as giving authority, too much authority to the wrong voice. Be careful the authority you give to what voices. The second thing he did, first thing, he entertained the wrong voices. Second thing was that he acted on the wrong information. One of the problems with, with, with entertaining the wrong voices is that how many of you know that what we take in, the words and the things we listen to, that information we gather generally produces some kind of action. It generally produces some kind of outworking in our life. In Elijah's case, in uh, 1 Kings 19.3, it says, And when he saw that or when he heard that message from the messengers, what did he do? He arose and he ran for his life. He was standing in a place with this wonderful, amazing victory not, o not only did he have that victory over the prophets of Baal, but, be, but just after that, he runs to the top of a mountain, sees a cloud, and the drought breaks. I mean, this is a good day in anybody's life. And then he hears these words, and he gives them that much authority that the next thing is, he then acted on the wrong information. He acted on that information. And he takes off and he starts running for his life. Anybody ever act on the wrong information in their life? Anyone ever think what they heard was true and you've acted on it and in hindsight in reflection you realize that actually wasn't 100 percent accurate information um, a number of years ago me and my best mate got invited to a 
what we were told was a dress-up party. And the theme was 1980s rock music. And so we were told that everyone's getting dressed up in 80s gear and we're going to meet at the Ballina race course and it's a big 80s thing party. And so like, me and my friend, 80s, who, who agrees that 80s is the greatest era for music in the history of mankind? Okay, um, no, that's okay. The rest of you can be wrong. That's all right. Um, <laughs> hey, I love you with the love of Christ and we're more unified over that than we are divided over your musical poor preferences, but that's okay. So we, we, what we did is we went out, we hired costumes, spent some money, got some costumes. We dressed ourselves up. And back in the 80s, who remembers the hair bands? The big hair bands, you know? I was into the big hair bands. So we got dressed up and we had our gear on and our clothes. And I don't remember who I was, John Bon Jovi or something like that. Then we're all dressed up and we get to the race course and we get out of the car and we walk into the race course looking cool and suave. Here we are, 80s rock stars. We walk up the stairs and we walk into this room and we look around and there was just something unusual about the room. Everybody was dressed in normal clothes, except for us. So we're looking around and everyone's giving us these weird looks like, who is this freak show that just walked in? And so we just came to the conclusion, well, obviously we're in the wrong room. So we walked up to somebody and said, oh, is this such and such as party? And as we did, it was like a scene in a movie, just slow motion, I turned. The crowd parted and the lady that invited us walked through the crowd and burst out laughing at us. It was like a movie slow-mo scene. And she's just killing herself, thinking this is the funniest thing. And I said to her, why would you do this to us? Why did you tell me this? She said, because I knew that you and him were dumb enough to do it. (laughs) And she was right. And so the rest of the place had a wonderful evening mocking us and laughing at us. It was an okay party anyway. We acted on the wrong information. Now, acting on that information was nothing more than embarrassing. But how many of you know that acting on the wrong information can sometimes have more dire consequences than that? Sometimes that can, it can cause relational breakdowns. You know, sometimes it can cause health problems. Uh, sometimes it can be downright dangerous acting on the wrong information. And so we want to be careful that we're taking in the right stuff, we're entertaining the right voices, because the truth is you are going to act eventually on the information that you have. Ralph Waldo Emerson, and everybody would know this famous quote, I'm sure, he said, sow a thought, reaping, no, you never heard this, sow a thought, reap an action, no, Ralph Waldo, no, okay, Google it. Ralph Waldo Emerson, sow a thought, reap an action. Sow an action, reap a habit. Sow a habit, you reap a character. Sow a character, you reap a destiny. In other words, your destiny can begin with the thoughts that you think. The thoughts that you think. It all comes back to the thoughts that you think. But you sow a thought long enough, it will reap an action in life. That's the way that it works. And the problem with consistent actions is this, that when you do something consistently, you get this little thing called momentum. Anyone know what momentum is? It's, it's when going in a certain direction or doing something becomes easier than it did when you first started. Sin can be like that. You can get momentum in sin. First couple of times, it was a bit difficult to do, sneaking around or whatever, and then after a few times, you, you find that it's easier and easier to do. Why? Because you've got a bit of momentum. Anyone ever, when they were kids, have a swimming pool or go to the swimming pool with a bunch of mates and do that thing where, you know, you all walked around in the same direction? Anyone ever do that? Remember that as kids? And we'd all walk in the same direction. And what would happen is at first it's kind of hard, isn't it? You're trudging a bit. But then after a while, you get this, what they call momentum. The water starts going with you. So you end up putting in less effort now because the momentum of the water is helping you head in the same direction. Did you ever get to the point where you went, everyone clapped their hands and went, now, and you all turned and tried to go in the other direction after you'd created this incredible, yeah? It's tough, isn't it? It's difficult because you're going against the momentum. Well, that can be the problem with, with, with what we meditate upon and the voices that we give too much credence to and they produce actions. Those actions, if we are consistent enough with them, they will produce momentum in our life. So we want to be very careful about the information that we're acting upon. Make sure that what we're acting upon is taking us in the direction that we actually want to go. Because if it's not, it's not impossible to change direction, but it becomes harder the more momentum that you get behind you. It gets harder as time goes on. And thirdly, thirdly, final one. First one, he entertained the wrong voices. Secondly, he acted on the wrong information. And the third thing that Elijah did that was very unhealthy was that he then isolated himself from other people. It says in verse 3, After Elijah had taken off, he went to Bathsheba, which belongs to Judah, and he left his servant there. We don't know why he left his servant there. Maybe his servant just simply wasn't as physically fit as he was. Maybe he could 
you know, you ever, ever go jogging with someone that couldn't keep up with you? Maybe that's why. Maybe he had compassion on his servant. And went, You're so unfit, brother. You sit here, get your breath. I'm going to keep on running out into the wilderness by myself so I can lay down and give up on life. We don't know why he left him there, but what we do know is this. It doesn't say Elijah's servant left him. It says that he left his servant. And the third unhealthy thing that Elijah did was he isolated himself in his time of anxiety and worry. He isolated himself from other people. How many of you are aware the first time God ever said it's not good? The first time God ever said it's not good was when it was God and Adam. Isn't that, isn't that strange? We think that the perfect world would be just me and God. I don't need any of you. I just need me and God. And I've found Jesus now, so I, I, don't, I don't need the rest. I just need me and God. Well, Adam had God in a perfect world before sin came. And God said to Adam, it's not good that you're alone. It can't just be me and God. It's me, God, and others. That's the full picture. That's the image of the church. That's, that's what's healthy. Being alone and isolating yourself, even as Christians, Christians who say, I've, just, I've got God, that's all I need. Let me tell you, it's unhealthy. It's not healthy. It wasn't good enough for Adam when God was there. It's not good enough for you today. And Elijah isolated himself from others. He pulled back. Why do we do that? Well, sometimes we do it because we, we think we don't want to be a burden to others. I don't want to put my problems and issues onto you. I don't want to be a burden to other people. Hey, guess what? We're a family here. We're meant to carry one another's burdens, people. Hey, we're meant to support one another. We, 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 we mourn with those who mourn. We laugh with those who laugh. We're, we're, we're a family. The church is a family. And we're meant to. It's part of our mandate. It's part of our call. It's part of our gift is to be able to carry the burdens of one another. So don't isolate yourself and keep all your stuff to yourself. Maybe we feel like, well, it's not your problem to solve. Anyone ever feel like that? Well, it's not their problem. It's my problem. It's not their problem. It's, it's, it's my problem to have to solve. Hey, I can't solve my own problems. That's why I need Jesus, and that's why I need you. I need people around me. We can't solve our own problems all the time. And maybe we convince ourselves sometimes that nobody can help us. You ever heard that? No one understands me. Nobody could help me anyway. Well, can I just caution people that think that way? I know we don't mean this. But we've got to be very careful because what we're really saying is I am such a unique human being. My experience is so unique to the human condition. Nobody's ever been through what I've been through. Nobody could ever possibly understand. I know we don't mean it this way, but it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a false sense of pride when we speak like that. Like our problem or our issue is so unique and so grandiose that there's nobody in the world that can help me. I, I just don't believe anybody's problem is that unique, that there's not another human being out there that can help them with their issues and so on. So don't buy into that voice that says, don't tell anybody, no one can help you. Sometimes you've got to find the right people to help you walk through situations. Sometimes you've got to find the right people. But don't give up and think that nobody could. And if you don't believe me, let's have a look at Jesus in what was perhaps Jesus' most vulnerable uh, moment in the Gospels that we know of. The, most, the, the moment where he opened his heart up. Matthew 26, verse 36 to 39. Look at this. This is how Jesus handled perhaps his most anxious moment. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And watch this. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. Now, here's Jesus. He's got the 12 there. And he takes them to Gethsemane. And then he goes, I'm going to go a bit further. And he leaves nine of them and he takes three. A little further down the road. How many of you know that Jesus had the, the multitudes, there was the crowds that hung around Jesus, and they saw a, a certain amount of what Jesus did, what he was about, and a certain amount of vulnerability. Then there was the 70 or 72. They, they worked with him on a deeper level. They would have experienced a bit of different side of Jesus, seen a little more perhaps vulnerability, a bit more understanding. Then, then, of course, there was the 12. And then in amongst the 12, how many of you know there were the three, Peter, James, and John? There were some significant moments, the Mount of Transfiguration, a few other moments where Jesus took those three, Gethsemane, he pulled those three aside, and they got to see a little more depth and vulnerability to Jesus than the others did in those moments. And then even amongst the three, how many of you know there was one young fellow called John? Remember when Jesus is having dinner and he says, someone here's going to betray me? And one of them leaned across to who? Little John. And said, John, you ask him, because he'll tell you. Won't tell us, but we, we, we believe he'll tell you. You see, we've all got a multitude in our world. We've all got 70 in our world. We've all got a 12. We've all got a 3. And we've all got a 1. It's not easy always to find them. But what I want to say is this. It's worth trying to find them. It's worth looking for them. Jesus himself had these people. And here's what he said when he got those three alone. He actually said this to them. He said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. 
Stay here and watch with me. My soul is exceedingly sorrowful. Now, now, then he goes on from there, pulls himself a few feet away or whatever, and then what does he do? He prays. He says, Father, if it's possible, take this away. But what did he do? He didn't just take it to God and just pray. He also took it to man. And he said, guys, here's what's going on on the inside of me. I'm struggling right now. My soul's really sorrowful. I've got this anxiety, this worry, this stuff going on inside. And so it's not good enough just to say, well, I'll just pray about it. I'll keep it to myself, bottle up, and I'll just take it to God. And we isolate ourselves from people. Nothing healthy or good ever comes from isolating yourself. And I've seen too many experiences of Christians who have literally, I've got one Christian, mate, who literally went batty and ended up in a a, a psychiatric ward. And it all began because he isolated himself from others. Don't isolate yourself. We need one another. Sometimes it can be foolish to tell everybody, but there's always wisdom in telling somebody. And if you're anxious or you've got worry and things going on in your world, here's the thing, coming out of lockdown, you know what it's going to do? It's not going to take away all of that stuff. Sometimes when you come out of lockdown and people are still battling with it, it exacerbates it. Because people start going, I shouldn't be feeling like this now. We're out of lockdown. Why am I still anxious in that? I could understand it before. I had a reason. We were, but now we're out. Sometimes when we get the, this, the su- supposed freedoms that we have, sometimes those moments exacerbate because all the reasons why you thought that was there are taken away. And now, now people are going, I don't have an answer now because I, I was blaming that. I thought it was all this. So even as we're coming out of lockdown, let me encourage you. If you've got worry and anxiety and things going on, hey, find, find somebody and talk to them about it. Begin that journey. And if you don't have that person, find that person. Find that person. Trial and error if you have to, but don't give up because that person is there. Because we need one another. Amen? Daniel, you guys want to jump back up on the guitar? I want to finish up. The Black Dog Institute. Anyone ever heard of Black Dog Institute? It's, it's an institute here. It started in New South Wales where they research uh, mental health um, throughout the lifetime of, 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 of people. It's a not-for-profit. And on their website, they actually state this. They say that staying connected is one of their greatest tips for managing anxiety. Staying connected with other people is one of their top tips for managing anxiety. And, of course, they stress that during this period that we've just been through with COVID. You see, anxiety and worry, they're not just about how you're feeling now, but they're about where you'll be standing tomorrow. It's not just about how you're feeling right now. It's about where you'll be standing tomorrow. Elijah was standing in Mount Carmel. He took in the wrong information. He acted on the wrong information. He gave too much authority to the wrong voices. He isolates himself and he ends up in a wilderness, face down, defeated, beaten, literally, literally, this man of God, this man of God, with faith enough to bring about a revival to a whole nation, faith enough to put his life on the line and stand toe-to-toe with the prophets of Baal. This man of God ends up in a wilderness laying down saying, God, take my life. I can't deal with this. I can't deal with this. It's interesting. Why? Well, three things he didn't do well. He entertained the wrong voices. He acted on the wrong information. And then he isolated himself from others. And that anxiety and that worry took him on a journey. It took him to a place where God didn't necessarily want him to be. But he, he, here's the good thing. Here's the good news. Even though he ended up in the wilderness, guess who met him there? It was God. And when you feel defeated and down and realize that you've been running down a wrong path, and maybe you realize you've done some of these things, you, you've entertained the wrong voices, maybe you've acted on some wrong information, maybe you've isolated yourself. Well, here's the good news for you. You don't have to turn around and retrace your steps and go back to Mount Carmel to find God. Because God's been running with you. All we need to do is just turn our hearts and our attention back to God. Acknowledge, yeah, God, you know what? I've been entertaining the wrong voices, God. Help help, help me get rid of those voices. Help me to, to, to entertain the right words, the right voices. God, I've been acting on wrong information and it's leading me a wrong way. God, help me. Give me the courage, the grace, the strength to know the right information and the ability to act on the right information. Lord, I've isolated myself. God, I'm sorry. Father, I'm going I'm, I'm to reach out to people and I just pray, Holy Spirit, guide me, lead me, help me find those right connections, those right people. Give me grace on that journey, Lord, because I need other people. And if you're here today and you recognize any of those things in your world, I just want to encourage you in that. You don't have to go back somewhere. God is there with you right now, today, in this very moment. In this very moment. 
See, worry and anxiety have a plan for your life. They have a plan for your life. Do not be deceived. They have a plan for your life. They want to take you on a journey. They want to take you on a path. God wants to guide us by peace in our heart. God wants to guide us by His Spirit. The devil wants to use worry and anxiety to take you way over here so that you also end up at a place where you just want to give up and die. God's got good plans for your life. Amen. He's got good plans for mine. He met Elijah at the back end of his journey. And I believe that God's eager to meet each one of us as well. I'm just going to pray for us. When, when, when I pray, we're going, to, we're going to finish up. If you want to go and grab tea and coffee next door, we've, we've bought the best milk in town this morning. We literally asked, what's your best carton of milk? The healthiest has been tested and we've got it in the fridge there. Got the best coffee out there. We've got sugar that's, if you like sugar, it's good for you if you like it that sugar type we've prayed over it let's have some time together just hanging out we've missed that for a while but I also want to encourage you I've asked these guys just to play for a bit if you want to sit here quietly and just spend some time with God I've missed how many of you have you missed I've, I've missed just sitting quietly in the presence of God not that I can't do that at home I can and this building is not more anointed than your home by the way but there's just something about the environment there's something about when the people of God come together and Jesus said that I'm with you always but he said when two or more gather I just want you to know I'm really there there's something about gathering and being in a place together so if you want to just sit and maybe just have some time with God maybe you might want to pray for one another there might be somebody on your heart as I was sharing this morning you might be thinking of somebody here why don't you go and ask them hey are you you doing alright can I pray for you why don't we continue I think the worst thing that could possibly happen is that we all begin to meet back in a building and we go back to being people who attend church and we stop being church. Hey, we got a bit of momentum, people. It's, the, the, the family of God got a bit of momentum through COVID. That momentum was this, is pushing us towards being church. We had to reach out to one another. We had to take care of one another. We had to think about one another. We had to pray. We got that momentum. Let's not lose that momentum just because we're able to attend a meeting together. Amen. So, Father, I want to pray for every person in this place. God, I want to pray for people that are watching online as well, God. Father, I want to uh, just thank you again, Lord. You are all powerful. God, you are all knowing. And God, you are all present. God, there's no, there's no little dark corner where you don't exist. God, there's no shadowy place where you're not there waiting for your people. And, and I just pray this morning, Holy Spirit, if there are people here that are wrestling with anxiety and worry. Lord, I pray that you would direct their attention. Father, show them. Where, where is it? What, what, is, what is that thing? What's the, what's the moment perhaps for them where they got a little bit off track? Give them understanding this morning, Father. And, and Holy Spirit, would you guide and direct them as they get back on course? Would you lead them to the right people, God? Father, would you give them wisdom to know what are the right voices to entertain and what are the wrong ones? Give them the courage to make those choices they need to make. To remove themselves maybe from some of those wrong voices. God, give them wisdom to know what is the information they want to act on. What is the momentum that they want to build in their life. A momentum that will take them to the place you want them to go. To be the people you want them to be. And to have the things in their world that you want them to have. And to achieve with their life what you want them to achieve, Father. And God, I want to thank you just this morning too for the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. God, I thank you for that moment in human history that changed the world. God, I thank you that, uh, Father, God, I'm believing everybody in this room has had their own personal encounter with that moment. And if they haven't, then, Father, I pray. I pray, God, you would cause them to wrestle with that moment. God, if there are people listening uh, even people here that haven't stepped across that line, have not fully given their lives over to you, have not fully surrendered control, have not acknowledged the part they played in your death, that it was your sin, it was their sin that you died for, not, 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 not Jesus, it was, it was their. Father, if there are people listening uh, who are in that category, I pray, Holy Spirit, would you convict their hearts when you speak to them? Would you lovingly draw them to you? And Father, we ask this all this morning in the mighty name of Jesus. Everybody said, amen. Amen. Bless you guys. Tea, coffee next door. If you want to sit.
pray, think these guys are going to be here and, and, and play a long time. Bless you.